At this time, let us receive as Kevin Bradley. God, words for God bless. Let us pray. Give him a hand, praise Lord Jesus. Move forward. I must be here to ask the choir to come with a selection after I call the discipleship. The choir come with a selection. Church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask everyone just to bow your heads briefly. Father, we pray that as this word goes forth, Father, that you anoint and touch the speaker, Father. Not only the speaker, we pray that you anoint and open up people's hearts, Father, so they may receive what you have given me, Father. We pray that you let it be always all about you, Father, not about me, Father. Let your Holy Spirit take over as we come forth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank God. Amen. 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 I'm not going to be before you long today, but it's a message that is needed. And right now, I'm just going to go ahead and get into the subject of my message. The subject of my message is 300. 300. There was a popular movie out not too long ago by the name of 300, where 300 men held up thousands of men. And what God is needing today is he just needs 300. It's not a number. He just needs some people who are willing to take a stand or who are going to be standing on the word of God. And we're going to go to a lot of scriptures today because, you know, in Matthew 4, it says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that was seen out of the mouth of God. So anytime you say something, you want to be able to back that thing up with scripture because if you can back it up with scripture, guess what? You're not mad at me. Why are you mad at it? God. You're mad at God. If you get mad at me, that's one thing. But if you get mad at God, you have a problem. Amen. So we're going to start out in the book of Judges. We're going to read Judges, the seventh chapter, the first through the seventh verse, and also the 16th through the 18th verse. Judges, the seventh chapter, the first through the seventh verse, then the 16th through the 18th verse. And it reads, Then Jerubalah, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. How do many people know that sometimes we have too many people we'll brag on ourselves? So God didn't want Israel to brag on himself. He said, now therefore go into, go to, proclaim in the ears of the people saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the Mount Gilead and there return other people 20 and 2,000 and there remain 10,000. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, and the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that laugheth of the water with his tongue as a dog laugheth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that bowed down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that laughed, put in their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. Everyone say with me, 300. 300. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300, everyone say 300. 300. Men that laugh, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thy hand, and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. 16th through the 18th verse, same chapter, chapter 7. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that, as I do so shall ye do. When I blow the trumpet, and I and all that are with me, then bow ye, blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Everyone say with me one more time, 300. 300. 300 working together on one accord. Uh -huh. But let's look what we had to do before we got to the 300. First, he had to make the cut. Look at Judges 7 and 3. And he said, Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. See, we have some Christians who are afraid. Uh -huh. We have some Christians who are fearful. 
and there were 22,000 left. He see, he started out with 32,000. But when he said, those who are afraid, step back. Nothing held against him. But if you're fearful, we don't need you with us. If you're a fearful Christian, you can't fight the good fight. We heard about fighting a good fight last week from the pastor. You can't fight the good fight if you're a fearful Christian. A lot of us are afraid. But let's go to 2 Timothy 1 and 7. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. Second Timothy 1 and 7. And what does it say? For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So God has given us power. He has given us love. He has given us a sound mind. God has not given us the spirit of fear. See, we have too many Christians trying to be politically correct. They're just afraid to stand for what is right. See, political correctness will not get you to heaven. Political correct correctness will put you in hell. We have Christians who are afraid to pray in the name of Jesus. The Bible teaches us that that is the only name whereby we must be saved. So if you do not pray, when you pray, you get somewhere you give up. Politically correct, I heard a young lady praying. She said, and, and his precious son name, and whose son's name? I have two sons myself. My daddy has two sons. Mr. Hurst has some sons. Whose son are you praying to? You better say the name of Jesus, because there is power in the name of Jesus. Don't be afraid. Use the name of Jesus. Can you say, if you don't deny Jesus, what do you say? If you deny me, I'm going to deny you. We're going to get to that verse earlier. I'm going to get a little help ahead of myself, because I'm getting a little excited. But see, some of us going to pray in Jesus' name. What's wrong with you? Who you afraid of? Don't be afraid of those who can just kill the body, but be afraid of the one who can destroy the body and the soul. You can kill this body, but you can't send me to heaven or hell. If you don't want me to pray in the name of Jesus, don't ask me to pray. We're trying to be politically correct. Don't nobody want to hurt nobody's feelings. Everybody wants to say all religions are equal. All religions aren't equal. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the truth and the life. If you pray into Buddha, Muhammad, any of them folks, you're going to hell. Go to Muhammad. There ain't none of them folks got no heaven to send you to. You better pray in the name of Jesus. I can't be politically correct as a Christian. Let's go to Matthew 10 and 33. Go to Matthew 10 and 33. See, I'm going to give you some words. I might not preach you heavy, but I'm going to give you some words today. I'm going to give you some words that's going to help you out throughout the week when you get to come up against problems and when you come up against situations. It says, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him. Will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven? So if I deny Jesus and he denies me before the Father, there is no way that I'm making it into heaven. You can't deny Jesus. You have to, you, you can't deny. Jesus is the only way. You have to say the name of Jesus. You have to say it in your sleep. You ought to be saying Jesus. We want to deny Jesus because we're scared I hurt somebody feeling. You hurt them by sending them to hell when you ain't taught them the truth. Say the cut. That was cut number one, those who were afraid. That was cut number one. You know, on the baseball team, basketball team, sometimes they have a preliminary cut. She had to make one cut, but this was just the first cut. Now let's get to the second cut. Second cut, let's go back to Judges. Seven and six. And this is what I like about this cut. Gideon didn't even have to think about this thing. God said, you know what? Just do what I say, I'm gonna cut them for you. See, sometimes when people not acting right in the church, God said, just do what I say, I'm gonna cut them for you. But they don't want to stand up and step up and do what they ought to do. God said, don't worry about it. Just do what I say and I'm going to cut them for you. Right. So let's look at Gideon 7 and 6. I mean, Judges 7 and 6. Judges 7 and 6. And it reads, And the number of them that left put in their hand to the mouth were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. See, they got down on their knees. I don't know why they got down on their knees. It doesn't say there was something wrong with going down there on their knees. But apparently there was something that God didn't need with the people who got on their knees. He needed those people who laughed like a dog. See, that was the second cut. You see, they were good men. They were not fearful. But they needed some training. All right. Sometimes we need some training in the church. Sometimes we just don't know no better in the church. Sometimes we just haven't been taught. Sometimes we haven't studied it. That's the Bible tells me to study to show yourself approved. So if you haven't been taught something, you should have studied it on your own by now. Especially if you've been in church 30, 40 years. You're talking about you don't know no better. Come on now. 
This is my lesson right here. This is my scripture right here. Amen. This is my teaching right here. Amen. If the pastor doesn't teach it, if the minister doesn't teach it, if the missionary doesn't teach it, if the mother doesn't teach it, then I will get taught right here wow. in this Bible, in this Word of God. Yeah. Let's look at uh, uh, Romans 10 and 2. And let's see what was wrong with these men. We have people like that in the church today. Romans 10 and 2. Romans 10 and 2. These men weren't fearful. They weren't wrong. They just need a little bit more training. Romans 10 and 2. And it reads, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Sometimes we have the right zeal, but we just don't have the knowledge. There are people in the church who have the right zeal. They have the good enthusiasm, but they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the knowledge that they need. Then they just need to be taught. They just need to be trained. So these men, they had the zeal, but they didn't have the knowledge. You see, God made this cut. So we don't have to worry about that. God is going to make the judge. So if you have a zeal, then you need to be getting some what? Some knowledge. You need to be studying. You need to be fasting. You need to be praying. Because if you have a zeal without knowledge, then God's going to have to make another cut. He's going to have to cut you until you get that knowledge to go along with that zeal. Because if you have a zeal without knowledge, then sometimes you'll do some things wrong. If you have a zeal without the knowledge, then if I put you at the back door, you might get mad and get upset and not treat somebody right. If you have a zeal without the knowledge, you might get up and try to preach a word and not study. If you have a zeal without the knowledge, you might get in the choir and not want to know the words to the song. So you got to have some knowledge with all the zeal that you have. See, they had a zeal, but they didn't have knowledge. But let's look at the last cut. The 300. Let's look at the 300. Let's look. Judges 7 and 7. Judges 7 and 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300 men that left will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go every man unto his place. So he didn't get mad at him. He didn't say he was going to destroy him. Destroy him. He said, just go back to your place. Just go back home. I'm going to use what I have right here. See, sometimes we have guys going to have to sit some people down. See, the people who don't want to study, the people who don't want to get some knowledge, the people who want to have that zeal but don't want to get any knowledge to have the zeal and the knowledge to work together. See, God's going to have to cut him. He's not going to be mad. He just says, just get over to the side because I can't use you until you get what I need you to get. Sometimes you have to cut people in the church. You have to put them over to the side so they can get what they need to get. And then they get that knowledge. Then maybe they can get back on the team. See, we working some things right here. See, he had 300 people. He said, the 300, these are the only men that I'm going to need. By these 300, am I going to save you? I don't need anybody else. See, they had, they were going against thousands and thousands of men, but God said, all I need is 300. I don't want you to get the glory. I need myself to get the glory. I don't want you to get the big head because you need to depend on me because without me, you are nothing. I don't need all these men that you had. From 32,000, he brought, he brought 22,000 men. After that, he only had 10,000 left. Another 97 100 when you do the math, men left the second time. But he said, I don't need them. All I need is 300. But can we get 300 people? Can we get 300 people in Lowell? Can we get 300 people in Arkansas? We're going to be what God needs need us to be. We're going to do what God needs us to do. We need 300 people. There's 300 men to stand up. 300 men and women working together standing up. He said, See, these men, they weren't afraid to get down and dirty. See, I don't know if there was anything wrong with the men who got down on their knees. Maybe they just didn't have all the right knowledge. But the men who laugh like dogs, see, sometimes you got to get dirty, get down, get down with it. Sometimes you got to hit the street. Sometimes you got to minister to people who don't want to be ministered to. Sometimes you got to share your testimony. Sometimes you got to let people know you ain't always been hurt. That you have done some dirt too. 300. Can I get 300? We don't even have 300 in this church, but if I can get 300 people, not 300, but just three people praying strong, going forward, innocent for this church. Imagine we have to turn around where you get 300. Everywhere I look, we have a church on every corner. All of them should be saved. Five or six churches within a, when here. We ought to be our witnesses. When was the last time we hit the streets? See, I didn't hit the streets. See, I mean, I, yeah, see, I done hit the streets. I done went door to door. I done done that. We need to hit the streets sometime. Because God said the gospel is going to be preached at what? Every creature. Everyone's going to have a chance to hear. And when we get saved, what are we to be? According to Acts 1, 8, 1 and 8, we're supposed to be what? Witnesses. We ought to be our witness to tell somebody. And see, these men, these 300, they were like in Ephesians 6 and 11. They talk about having on the whole armor of God. So these men had on the whole armor of God. They were prepared. They were ready. They were ready for the war. They had everything they need. They had the training they need. They were ready to get down and dirty. They were ready to go out and fight. They weren't worried about getting pretty. They weren't worried about getting their dress dirty. They weren't worried about getting their suit dirty. They were ready to get down and dirty like a dog for God. How many of us are ready to get down and dirty for God? 300. 
I'm going to slow it down right here. Let's look at Judges chapter 7, 17 and 18. And this is the problem that the church has. It says, and he came unto them. And he said unto them, look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. As I do, so shall ye do. See, a lot of problems, time, problem, we have problems because we want to do our own thing. A lot of times we have problems because we can't get on one accord. All right. And he said, when I blow the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side. All the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. See, a lot of times we get worried about looking alike as far as dress. Everybody needs to dress this way. We need to do this and we need to do that. But it wasn't how they were dressed that he was concerned about. Right. It was how they were looking alike. Right. They were looking alike in their actions. Yeah. As Christians, yeah. we ought to be looking alike in our actions. Yeah. As Christians, we shouldn't be contradicting each other. Yeah. As Christians, we shouldn't be at war with each other. I had a Muslim tell me, she said, how can I believe in Jesus and get saved and y'all can't agree amongst each other? She cut me deep, but the sister had a good point. Then I did some study and found out the Muslims don't get along either. They got different sex, just like we do. Running around, killing each other, cutting up, just like you know a lot of times Christians do. But see, I had to do some study, and that's why we have to study and show ourselves proof. But let's look at Acts 2 and 1. Go to Acts 2 and 1. I won't be for another minute. Let's go to Acts 2 and 1. Acts 2 and 1. And it reads, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Lord have mercy. They were on what? One accord. They weren't bickering with each other. They weren't fighting with each other. They weren't being jealous of each other. They weren't trying to tear each other down. They were on one what? One accord. One accord in one place. Yeah, we said we can't fellowship with this church. We can't fellowship with that church. We don't like the way they do this. We don't like the way they do this. How can we be so separate and all of us reading the same Bible? Somebody has a misunderstanding somewhere. The next big problem we have is King Solomon said that there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 9. 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 9. Now this is coming from the word of God. This is not coming from Kevin. This is the word of God. It says, For while one said, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe? even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollo's water, but God gave the increase. Right. So then neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watered, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planted and he that watered are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are the laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. One said, I'm church of God in Christ. One said, I'm Baptist. One said, I'm a church of Christ. All right, all right. Who is the church of God in Christ? Who is the Baptist? Who is the church of Christ? Nobody. Nothing. Just men by whom y'all come to the Lord by. But according to this, one planted, one watered. But God gave the increase. So we shouldn't be worried about which denomination we come from. We shouldn't be worried about what's in here, what's in the book. What is the word of God? What does the word of God say? It does, it's not about denominational this. Even back then, he was saying, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? Who is this denomination? Who is that denomination? It's not about anything. It's about God. It's about Jesus. It doesn't matter where you come from. There's some people born in heaven and almost in a denomination. But I can guarantee you, it's twice as many people born in hell. In every denomination. I don't have some people falling short. I fall short sometimes myself. But the thing is, when you fall short, you better learn how to get back up. See, this is the word. This is the word that we need. It, 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 we got to get rid of all this, you know, these different spirits. Let's look at this. Let's look at the 1 Corinthians 1, 12 and 13. Just one page before that. It says, now this I say that every one of you said, I am of Paul and I of Apollos and I of Cephas and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Oh, oh my goodness. Wait a minute. Oh my goodness. Was anybody in the church of God in Christ crucified for you? 
Was anybody in the Baptist church crucified for you? Was anybody in the church of Christ crucified for you? Was anybody in the Methodist church crucified for you? Who went to the cross? Jesus. Right here, what does it say? Is, is Christ divided? Why are we divided? We all saying we Christians. What's wrong with that? There's something wrong with this picture. Somebody's not getting a full of, uh, understanding. The Bible says, "In other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. Yeah. We have to come together. Yeah. We can't come together. Somebody say 300. 300. If all these churches, all, all these churches in Long Island, I can just get 300 people together. I know everybody ain't going to be saved, but I see people walking the street this morning. Yeah. What's going on with that? People washing their cars. Yeah. All these churches around here, you got to wash your car. All you have to do is walk next door. No excuse. No excuse. No excuse at all. Amen. Now, why are we divided? The last toe I'm going to step on today is tradition. Mark 7, 5 through 9. Mark 7, 5 through 9. See, it has to be spoken. It has to be done. It has to be said. Go to Mark 7 chapter. I want everyone to get there. We have to say amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Mark 7. Amen. Amen. 5 through 9. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well, I have besides prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honored me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it? In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of me. For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things ye do. We get so caught up in tradition. Do this, do that, wear this, wear that. Don't do this, don't do that, don't go here, don't go there. Back it up with the word. What does the word of God say? You worried about a woman wearing a, uh, where she had blue jeans on or a skirt. I see some of these short skirts. I'd rather see a woman in some jeans and have some have a skirt and then we gotta put her to the back. We gotta go get her a napkin or a handkerchief or something to put her on her legs so she won't distract people in the church. All this is is tradition. A lot of this stuff is tradition. Do this this way, do this that way, do that that way. Back it up with the scripture. Get the scripture and back it up. Go to the word of God and back it up. See, sometimes we put aside the word of God. We forget about the number one commandment, which is what? Love. We put aside the word of God. We put aside the number one commandment of love because we worried about tradition. We worried about we got to look prim. We got to look proper. Then we got a man in a, in a dress in a two or three piece suit sleeping with every woman he can in the church. He looking prim and proper, but his heart ain't right. We need to be worried about what these people's heart is about. We need to worry about what they soul is right. We need to worry about what they're doing. The commandments of God, are they following the man? It's not how they dress. We, we got it backwards. We got it backwards. We got this thing mixed up. See, that's why the church, I'm full of this church. This church should be full on both sides. But when you get to worry and be concerned about the, the wrong things, then the church can't grow. The church can't prosper. No, I'm not saying you let somebody come up in church shacking, doing this, doing that. No, I'm not saying that you let a homosexual get up in the poor prison and preach because you need to sit them down because it's not according to the commandments of God. But we need to get them up in here so they can hear some of this word. How can you be convicted if you ain't never heard? But see, I like what Gideon said. Gideon put God first. Gideon said, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. A lot of our problem is, is we saying the sword of Kevin and of the Lord. The sword of the pastor and of the Lord. The sword of the Ursha and of the Lord. See, we got it backwards. We got this thing mixed up. We got to flip the script like they say. It got to be the sword of the Lord that being with you. See, a lot of times we're trying to get God to go along with our plan when we need to be following along with his plan. Go to Matthew 6 and 33. This is the last scripture I'm going to take you to. Matthew 6 and 33. And I'm going to close out with this. Matthew 6 and 33. 6 and 33. What does it say? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. If we seek God first, we want to see kingdom growth. Not just church growth. See, there's a difference between church growth and kingdom growth. See, when we came back, we were already in the kingdom. But we need to get some people off the street who don't know anything about God and bring them in. 
That's when the kingdom is growing. See, a lot of people get church growth mixed up with kingdom growth. But when you bring bringing people in out at a revival, when people are getting saved and filled, that's when the kingdom is growing, not just the church. It's good for the church to grow, but we want the kingdom to grow, not just the church. We want the kingdom to prosper, not just the church. Because we should be all in this as one. We got to start getting together. We got to bring this thing together. See, we got to seek the kingdom first, not the church. A lot of people, we seeking the church first. We not seeking the, seeking the kingdom. We seeking to please the pastor. We seeking to, seeking to please the first lady. We seeking to please the mothers. We seeking to please the denomination. We seeking to please the bishop. We seeking to please the superintendent. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. If you please in God, then it doesn't matter if other people are pleased. If I'm pleasing God, I don't care if he doesn't like what I'm saying. If I'm pleasing God, anybody can be mad at me because because if I have God with me, he's more than the world against me. Right. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We need to be seeking the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Someone needs to be seeking the kingdom. Yes, yes, man. Yes, Lord. And I'm going to close out with that. Mm. But I want the church to say with me one more time. 300. 300. Can I get 300? 300. Can I get three? In Lolo, can I get 300? Mm. In Ritual, can I get three people with it? To Tennessee. Yes, to take it to the other island. Can I get three people, three people who are willing to bring the water into their mouth and not like a dog? Can I get three? Can I get three people who are willing to go to war with me? Can I get three? Can I get, get three people who are worse out worrying about tradition and denomination? Can I get three? Can I get three people who are worried about saving souls? Can I get three? All I need is three. Three. The Bible says, when two or three are gathered together in my name, God will be also. He's going to be in this. Can I just get three? If I can get more than three, God be blessed. So God be glory. But all I need is three. I just need three people to go forth with me. Three people to go forth with me. Just three people to go forth with me. Three people who get out of that old mind state. Three people who get into the new mind state. Can I just get three? That's all I need is three. See, we take this whole thing to another level. And see, when we get to another level, there are another I can't understand why I'm being crucified like this because you're trying to go up. You're trying to grow. It's, it's, it's an example I gave a young person the other day. If you are at war, you have a Humvee, you have a tank, and you have a battle cruiser, which one are you going to attack first if you are the enemy? I'm going to attack that battle cruiser first because I'm going to get that battle cruiser out of my way because that's my biggest concern. After I destroy that battle cruiser, what can I do? I'm going to go after that tank. After I destroy that tank, then I'm going to go after that Humvee. And then if anyone's left, any foot soldiers, then I'm going to get them last. See, we got to be the tank. We got to be the battleship. We got to be on a whole other level. We got to be the ones that the devil is afraid of. We have to be the ones that the devil fears. We have to go to a whole other level. And once you get to another level, then you're going to be attacked. If you're not being attacked, something is wrong. If you're not facing any opposition, something is wrong. You ought to be attacked sometimes if you don't and you fight over. And this is a war. We war against principalities. Principalities against spiritual weakness in what? High places, not low places. It's high places for spiritual weakness as well. So we got to be ready. There may be someone today, someone who heard something, just maybe touched their heart. Someone may want to give their life to God.